a long time, it felt like my life was plagued by bad news and really bad news. And my wife can testify to the fact that there were many, many, many days where I was convinced nothing good could come out of Nazareth. The world for every man, and I think it's better than the way it's being run. Okay, so we have Tolly and Chibichin starting his uh, new church here. Um, not sure what to say about it other than we've got to cover it. It's it's a situation where it the facets of why Holy Scripture teaches us to have certain men in pulpits that meet certain moral qualifications tends to make a lot of sense. Because in this situation, um, and especially when it comes to the celebrity pastor thing, um, these men tend to justify their sin in these pulpits and that's what seems to be happening here unfortunately with Chavichin. um now let me just lay this out there um Tolian Chavichin was somebody who helped me to understand the gospel better that's that's just a fact I'd been burdened by all law preaching for a long time and to hear Tolly and Chibichin preach the gospel and to exposit scripture in a way that included the gospel was very helpful and before his life kind of took a very wrong turn he was able to exposit scripture in a way that was helpful I think to a lot of people and I think that's true. However, since then, it seems like his message and the message of several others who have taken this unfortunate wrong turn, and, and it has to do with adultery, has to do with the breaking of the Sixth, the, the sixth Commandment, it's, it's, uh, since that, incident instead of going the way of warning people against sin and how that can derail your life they have chosen to continue down this path of justifying their sin to say that oh well we'll just go on sinning because the gospel covers it and that's no way to go and so um, while a lot of us need to hear the gospel, while we while uh, we've had all law preached to us our entire lives, and, and it's so refreshing to hear the good news, the promises of God's grace to us through Jesus Christ. I mean, the Lord God of the universe came down; He shrunk Himself into the womb of a virgin, was born. Grew up, lived, taught, was su suffered, was crucified, buried, and rose again on the third day. We need to hear that. And we don't hear that often enough in the American church. We hear, you need to do, you need to do, you need to do. That's true. I get that. I feel that. Um, I've, I've been at that place of, of exhaustion, but when you... When you come to grasp the gospel, especially in its fullness. Now, I'm wearing my stubborn German Lutheran shirt today to say that uh, when you grasp the gospel in its fullness, in the, in, in, the, in the Lord's baptism, in his supper, that you, <laughs> the um, motivation, the, the, the energy, the drive, to be the kind of person that God has created you to be, to be the man that God has created you to be. And, I, and this, this is an episode I, I particularly want to talk to men about because, uh, because for so long, and, and I'm still struggling with this, I'm still trying to be the man that God describes in Holy Scripture. But, um, but to have 
but to know that the Lord God of the universe came down and did that so I could be reconciled with him and adopted into his family and that now I am a son of God. And with that being a son of God becomes expectations. Um, and to know that, that, I have, that I'm going to be given the strength and that I can pray, Lord, help me um, be the man that you created me to be. That's, um, that's the kind of preaching I'm looking for. And unfortunately, Chavichin is just not going there. He's not, he's not going there. He's not going to go there. Um, and what unfortunately has happened is he is using this latest platform as a means by which he's going to justify his sin. And he's going to insert himself into a very simple text. And we're going to talk about that. Okay, but before we get to all that, let me remind you, we didn't have our opening thing. Uh, let me remind you uh, to go to laymanstermsradio.org and donate to, a, to our Kenya Well, Kenya well Project. Um, we're trying to raise money for these children who are at a Lutheran school in Kenya. They go to rivers and streams, people. They go to rivers and streams. That's what they do. You know, four out of five days, three out of five days, if they're lucky, two out of five days, to gather water so they can get through a school day. That's not good. We're trying to raise money in order to drill them a fresh water well so they don't have to do that, so they can focus on Holy Scripture, on the Catechism, and on their academics. So please donate to the Kenya Well Project. Also, welcome to all of you listening on Cane and of the Cross. We know you're out there. Thank you to Pastor Poppy and uh, all, uh, and, and you guys who, who have included us on your uh, over-the-air radio station. I love that. I love that we're, <laughs> we're actually on the air. Uh, we just don't say that. Thank you for all of you listening on KNNA, The Cross in Nebraska. Also, thank you to Steve Kozar and uh, the, the MessedUpChurch.com. Uh, tons of resources there. Uh, just an in, in, in innumerable amount. If you, I mean, if, if, if you're an atheist, if you're one of my atheist listeners, and you don't think we have something, something to critique about Christianity, not only is this episode an example of that, but go to MessedUpChurch.com, TheMessedUpChurch.com. And you will see some ways we will steer you where we are very critical of uh, North American Christianity. So thank you to Steve Kozar for including us there. So uh, so we're going to... Tolly and Tavichin was somebody who brought me back to the church. God, God used him to do that. That's true. However, it's, it's very interesting how fame and fortune and these sorts of things kind of play into that. We're, kind of, um, we're not going to work out too much of that. Uh, but, but at the same time, what, what I want to talk about is um, one thing that ultimately brought me back to faith was, um, was I just wanted to be a good husband. I just wanted to be a good father. And, and how can I do that? And, and, and a key aspect of that is being a good Christian. If, you're, if, if you are involved in a good Christian church, this is going to help you be a better man. Um, there's a podcast I've been listening to recently called The Art of Manliness. And it's, it's really helpful. It's good, it's good advice. But I've, but I've been uh, thinking about contacting them saying that, um, you know, uh, you guys don't do much on religion. And how religion helps men be better men. Because I think that the idea of religion, just, I mean, even if you don't believe, even if you just think it's all a farce, the idea, you know, the kind of the Jordan Peterson idea, we're just, we're just going to pretend like God exists, helps you be a better man than otherwise. And I wouldn't suggest that. I mean, I'm not endorsing that, obviously, because I think philosophically um, and, and in all other manners of reason that it, it's very difficult to get around the, the notion of God. All right. And so, but the point being uh, that even if you're going to pretend 
that there's a God. This is going to help you be a, a better man. And if you're going to pretend there's a God, then, you know, what, what religion, what version of that are you, are you going to pretend with? Right? Um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily encourage you to pretend, but if that's your starting place, then maybe just pretending, maybe pretending with us Lutherans who really take this stuff seriously, who really believe that the Lord's body and blood is present in front of us in the bread and wine every Sunday might be a good starting place. Might be a good starting place. So at any rate, um, what I want to discourage you from is the path that Juvichin is taking people down at this point. All right. We're going to critique one of his sermons. We may critique a couple of his sermons here um, just to make the point. This isn't the way to go. This isn't the way to go. All right. So let's uh, let's get started with this. And to and to do that, uh, what I want to what I want to do is read the passage that she, that he's going to be preaching on. It's from um, St. John's Gospel, uh, the first chapter, starting in verse 43 and following. And it says this. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathaniel said, uh, Nathaniel said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathaniel said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. All right. So far, the passage of Scripture we're talking about, let's let to bitch in pontificate on this and we'll go from there one of importance came from there to nathaniel it seemed highly unlikely that the messiah the one that god promised would come would come from a place like that if you were looking for the one that the prophets talked about he thought go to jerusalem go to the place of sophistication go to the place of cultural importance that's where all the movers and shakers live that's where all the people of importance dwell. Other Bible scholars, as I was studying this, say that Nathaniel asked his question not primarily because it was a place of such geographical and cultural insignificance, but they say that he asked his question because Nazareth had a reputation for immorality, which is why he used the word good, implying that whatever came from Nazareth was not good in a moral sense. It was an immoral place. It was a very sinful place. It had a, a reputation for immorality and debauchery. And so Nathaniel says, can anything good, morally speaking, come from Nazareth? Um, it's not even thinkable to consider the fact that the one who was promised by God many, many years ago would come from such a debaucherous place. So some Bible scholars think that the reason Nathaniel said, can anything good come from Nazareth is because it was a very insignificant place. Other Bible scholars think that what he meant was uh, Nazareth was such an immoral place. Um, if the first interpretation means anything, it could mean, can anything great come out of a place so small? The second interpretation would mean, can anything good come out of a place so bad? All right, so um, Chavichin is completely missing the point of this passage so far. Uh, that is, some scholars debate, may debate what can anything good come out of Nazareth means. And some will talk about, well, it's a very small, insignificant place. 
And so therefore, can anything great come out of something so small? Or can anything good come out of something immoral? Now, this is complete speculation. Nobody knows what kind of city, morally speaking, Nazareth was. It could, it could have been a very debaucherous place, but there's no question that it was a small place. It was a very, very insignificant place. That, that, that was, that's pretty historically undeniable. But to talk about it as, as a debaucherous, immoral place is stretching the bounds of interpretation for this text. Now, you can speculate on that. But you already see where Chavichin is taking this. He's starting, to, he's starting to talk about how Nazareth is a place that is immoral and that the savior of all mankind came out of a town that was immoral and debaucherous. See? That's the place he's going. And what, what he's going to build on that is that when God wants to do his work, he takes something immoral and debaucherous and does his work with it. And while I will say, yes, that God does work around our sin, while God can work all things for good for those who love him, I completely agree with that, that to take that to the extreme, to say that God needs this debauchery, needs this sin in order to accomplish his purposes is wrong-headed. And this is where Jefitchin is heading, and I think it's wrong, and I think it's uh, not helpful, and I think that it's going to lead his people to think that, well, it doesn't really matter how I behave morally in this life. It doesn't matter whether or not I obey the commands of Holy Scripture. That's really not not what not that's not what's important. Because even you know, even if I disobey, and especially if I disobey the commands of Holy Scripture, that's when God can really use me. Is when I'm disobedient. And that is just simply not true. If you disobey the commands of Holy Scripture, you're going to screw your life up. Just like Tullian screwed his life up. Because he used to be a good preacher. He used to be a decent preacher. And I used to respect him. Because he would approach the text honestly. And while maybe he, as in past podcasts, as you've seen, I've criticized him for being antinomian from the get-go. Children. Um, and I'm not going to go through the whole gross, uh, all the gory details of his debaucherous lifestyle. But that's, but that's what he's, see, he's already inserting himself into this text. He can't even honestly exegete this text right because he's trying to insert himself into that text and to say that he's this debaucherous person, right? He's this Nazareth. And can anything good come out of him? That's where he's going with this. And it's, and it's sad. It's sad. Okay, let's move on. Um, if the first interpretation means anything, it could mean, can anything great come out of a place so small? The second interpretation would mean, can anything good come out of a place so bad? Now, I think both have merit. Both of those uh, interpretations have merit. Um, I tend to side with the second one because of the use of the word good seems to be implying morality or the lack thereof. But either one makes a strong point. Jesus shattered all preconceived notions of the kind of place that God's rescuer would come from. Right. Um, that's, again, Chavichin reading into the text. It seems to shatter all pre 
preconceived notions of where God's rescuer, rescuer would come from. No, it doesn't. If you understand um, the Old Testament, you know that God uses weak things to shame the wise. You know that God is going to bring his Messiah out of a insignificant place. Um, all of these things. That's what shocks Jesus him not shocks him. Obviously, he knows about this, but that's what that that's a lot of the stuff that Jesus calls uh, uh, the Pharisees out on. Have you not read? Do you not understand? And and even on the Emmaus road, when he's talking to to the men who uh, <laughs> who are questioning, hey, haven't you heard about what's going on? They killed Jesus, and and Jesus says says to them. Um, have you not read? Have you not understood? This, this isn't a big shock thing if you understand Holy Scripture. But if you abandon Holy Scripture in favor of your own tradition and your own interpretation, this is why Jesus talks about this. It's not a big shock. It shouldn't have been a big shock that Jesus would come out of, a, of an insignificant place. Um... And a place that may have been perceived as 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 immoral, that could be true, perceived as. Uh, but but again, you see Chavichin building this case where something good has to come out of something debaucherous. Now, can God work all things for good? Yes, that's yes, He can. Yes, that's true. Um, however. Uh, the problem I have with how Chavichin and others who have fallen to sexual sins in particular uh, present this is they talk about it in a way that it that they they say it's almost this is this was almost necessary. This was supposed to happen so that God could reveal His glory, so that God could do, so God's will could, and I just don't um, I don't subscribe to that. I don't. I don't think that God needs our sin in order to accomplish his purposes. I don't buy that. Not for one second. God does not need our sin to accomplish his purposes. God can accomplish his purposes <laughs> quite apart from our good works, let alone our sinful nature. So um, that's... I'm afraid the case that Chavichin is trying to build here is that God really, the, the way God really works is through our sin, through our fallenness. And yes, does God work through our fallenness? Does God show his glory? Does God show his grace, his mercy, and these sorts of things? Yeah, of course, that's absolutely true. But to say that God needs us to sin, um, that's a bridge too far, in my estimation, and um, and I think that it, I, I I think in a practical way, this is encur this encourages Javitian's congregants to uh, a, 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 a libertinism. That's what I fear. Uh, he's encouraging. He's saying, you know what? Hey, you know, go out and you know if you if you, if you cheat on your wife, you know. God's going to use that in a mighty way. Um, you know, he, 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 obviously he's going to stop short of saying that. But he's also not going to discourage it either, is he? He's going to talk about how he had these scandalous affairs and how God was able to. So, um, yeah, I'm not down with this. Not down with this at, at, at all. Um, anyway, let's, uh, let's move on. So the question is, in essence, a question that we all ask. Can light really come out of darkness? Can redemption really come out of wreckage? Is it possible that light can come from darkness, that good can come from bad? The question for us is this, can anything good come out of failure? Can anything good whatsoever come out of that? Of course it can. Can you commit a sin and can, can God, 
it, it, it's it's the age old story of Joseph. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. And I am absolutely convinced that according to the account of Joseph in Genesis and according to what St. Paul teaches us in Romans, that God works all things for good for those who love him. So, the point is, the question is, should we just not worry about doing bad things or should we should we actually go out and do bad things should we go out and sin so that god can change those things for good see that's that's the question i'd like to see chavichin address to say that look um can god use our sin and bring good out of it of course he can He's the Lord God Almighty of the universe. But does, but does that mean that we should go out and sin in order that God might bring out good? That's exactly what St. Paul is talking about in Romans. Should we sin so that grace might abound? Should we sin so that good things can come out of and really i've listened to this entire sermon series and sadly chavichin talks as if what 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 requires what, what god's good acts are predicated on our sin that's how that's how chavichin speaks and that's what's discouraging about a lot of these guys who have fallen especially into sexual sin. This seems to be the particular uh, problem that these men fall into. And they think that they come somehow come to that conclusion that Tully and Chavichin had to divorce and abandon his wife and family in order that God's glory might be shown. I just don't buy that for a second. Okay, let's uh, let's uh, move on to this. I um, four years ago, as most of you know, because I've shared it very openly, my life. Um, if the first, in so the question is in essence a question that we all ask. Can light really come out of darkness? Can redemption really come out of wreckage? Is it possible that light can come from darkness? That good can come from bad? The question for us is this. Can anything good come out of failure? Can anything good whatsoever come out of teenage rebellion or divorce? Can anything good come out of my struggle with addiction? Can anything good come out of adultery? Can anything good come out of losing my job? Can anything good come out of someone who loved me turning their back on me? Can anything good come out of loneliness or discouragement or loss? Can anything good come out of an emotionally dead marriage or singleness or shattered dreams or you name it? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Okay, so let's go back to the passage. Uh, because Chavichin is completely missing the point here. If he was... Um, start in verse 46 here. Nathaniel said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathaniel said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathaniel answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. Now, so, if you're a good Bible scholar, and you study the text, and you look at the commentaries, you will see 
that um, at that phrase under the fig tree is a Hebraism for prayer. That's what makes complete sense out of this passage. Nathaniel said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. So in other words, when Nathaniel was praying, and Nathaniel is obviously a devout Jew, and he was praying, he wasn't under a literal fig tree. That's a Hebraism. And that makes complete sense of, uh, of Nathaniel's response. Rabbi, you are the son of God. Because when I was praying, you saw me. If you saw me, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. See, that makes complete sense out of that statement. And it, and it showcases Christ's divinity, see? But yet, <laughs> uh, Chavichin wants to point the focus on himself to say that I'm a debaucherous person. Nazareth is a debaucherous town. And... What I'm trying to, the case I'm trying to build here is that even though I'm a debaucherous person, good things can come out of me. And even though Nazareth is a debaucherous town, good things can come, come out of it, right? Maybe the reverse. Because Nazareth is a debaucherous town and good things came out of it, even though I'm a debaucherous person, good things can come out of me. That's really the point Chavichin is trying to drive home here and I don't think that's the point at all of this passage particularly because that 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 Hebraism is so powerful I saw you under the fig tree I saw you praying and Nathaniel says you saw me praying um, yeah, I, I, I was praying. Surely you must be God. That's, see, that's what grieves me about this sermon. Is that when Chibichin could have pointed out Jesus' divinity here, had he done his homework, he instead used the Nazareth, Nazareth reference as something to justify his debaucherous behavior. That's too bad. Because he could have used this point to say that, look, Jesus is God. He saw Nathaniel praying. And because he told Nathaniel that he saw him under the fig tree, which is this Hebraism for prayer that that Jesus is God that Nathaniel was praying to him it's such a beautiful thing so beautiful but yet Chavichin wants to use it to justify his debauchery it's just um it's just too bad he misses the point here. Okay, let's move on. I, um, four years ago, as most of you know, because I've shared it very openly, my life fell apart, absolutely fell apart in some surprising ways. And I was, for the first time in my life, absolutely hopeless and convinced uh, that I would never be happy again, that I would never enjoy life again. I was sure at that time that life was over. The loss, the guilt, the shame, the depression, it sapped my energy and it suffocated my excitement for life. And I can remember thinking many, many, many times, even though I didn't think about it in these terms, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Can anything good come out of something so bad is it possible that resurrection could follow death is it even possible that that could happen for me do you ever feel like that do you ever feel like 
nothing good could possibly come out of whatever situation you're in. Do you ever feel like that now? Do you look at yourself and do you look at your life and ever wonder, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Yep. So there it is. He's trying, he's, he, he's taking a moment where this is, this is, so use, to use a, uh, a, a Chivichin phrase where Jesus is showcasing, right? That's, that's a Chivichin term. Jesus is showcasing his divinity and showing that he is God. And instead of pointing that out, what Chivichin does is talk about how our moral failings are these good things coming out of Nazareth. That's where he's going with that. And it's, it, it, it's a strong emotional appeal because all of us have failed. All of us have failed morally it, to varying degrees, right? And so when Chubichin says, this is what Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about how your moral failings are the good things that God is, you know, this is how God is going to bring about his good will. Makes you feel pretty good, doesn't it? But it's a false good news, isn't it? That's not the gospel. The, the gospel is not that, hey, God, God is going to use your moral failings to bring about good things. Okay, now, does he do that? Of course he does. Of course he does. But the, but the gospel, the true gospel, is the forgiveness of sins based on the life, death, and resurrection and ascension into heaven of Christ. That's the gospel. The forgiveness of sins. Not that what we did amounts to something. Not that, not that our moral failings is, are, are contributing to this cosmic plan that God has. That's not, that's not the gospel gospel is that those sins are forgiven they're paid for by the lord jesus christ that's the gospel not that god can somehow use our debauchery to do something good which he can absolutely he can and he does no question about that that's not the good news though that's not the gospel the gospel is that God, for Christ's sakes, for Christ's sake, forgives us by what He's done, not what we've done. Isn't that interesting? All right, let's go a little bit more here. So many times over the course of the last four years, I thought there's no way it could get worse than this. And it did. I thought there's no way I've finally hit rock bottom. There is no level deeper than the one where I am, only to discover that there were many levels deeper than where I was. For a long time, it felt like my life was plagued by bad news and really bad news. And my wife can testify to the fact that there were many, many, many days where I was convinced nothing good could come out of Nazareth. No way. Life was over. The situation was hopeless. That hasn't ended, by the way. Uh, my circumstances have changed, praise God. Uh, and life has come out of death for me. And I, I do hope and I am excited about life. Uh, and I do love the people that are in my life and appreciate their love for me. So in that sense, that season is over. But So this is... Um... What I was really, when I was listening to this sermon, was hoping that Tullian would not do. He is inserting himself into this text. He's saying that I am the good thing that is coming out of Nazareth. That's what he's doing. Um, if you think about it. 
and 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 that's a that's the sad thing is his congregants aren't thinking that way um they're not they're they're not analyzing this on the level i'm analyzing it at (laughs) because uh because that but 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 that's what chavichin is saying i'm the good thing that is coming out of the debaucherous nazareth i am a debaucherous person and therefore um you know what's what's happening here is the good thing coming out of this debaucherous person he's he's inserting himself into the text all the while the 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 real point of the text is completely being missed like i said before you know what makes nathaniel give his confession it's the fact that jesus saw him praying jesus saw him praying Sprayism. I saw you. I saw you pray to me. That makes absolute sense. But yet, Chavichin is wanting to turn this into something about him. He's reading himself into the text. All right. Yeah, see what's going on here? Let's move on. When you are on the, the brink of despair, whatever that might look like for you, and you're experiencing a, a dark night of the soul, turning to yourself, turning inward will bring you no hope. It will bring you no rescue. It will bring you no relief. Too often our counsel to ourselves and our counsel to others is the equivalent of giving a drowning man swimming lessons. Paddle harder. Kick faster. It's like telling a one-legged person to jump higher and higher. The moment we think that the ultimate answer to whatever it is we're facing, either externally or internally, is to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, to exercise willpower and get out of the ditch, you and I both know. And the older you are, the more you know it, uh, because you've lived a lot longer. That collapses underneath you 10 times out of 10, 10 times out of 10. Uh, We assume that we possess the internal power to get things right, and so we turn into ourselves. But as too many people already know, every internal answer falls apart eventually. Turning to the external object of your faith, that's what Nathaniel does. He goes, you are the son of God. You are the one. My hope is in you. My trust is in you. It's not in me and what I can do. It's in you and what you can do. Turning to the external object of your faith, namely Jesus and his finished work for you, is the only place to find peace and reorientation and and help. The gospel always directs you to someone outside not something inside you for the assurance that you crave in seasons of desperation and doubt. Our hope and our security is not in our strength, but in his. I said this a number of weeks ago or something like this, but I am alive today, not because in my darkest moments I held on to God. That's not why I'm standing here today. Because somehow in my darkest moments, I got myself right and I pulled myself out. That is not why I am breathing. That is not why I'm standing here. I am standing here today because in my darkest moments, God never stopped holding on to me. I let go of him many, many, many times. We all do, still do in a variety of different ways. The good news of the gospel is that God never stops holding on to us. It's his strength, not ours. It's his commitment, not ours. It's his devotion, not ours. It's his resolve, not ours. The comfort you long for 
when everything seems to be falling apart, won't come from discovering the hero within, okay? But only from the realization that you've already been discovered by the hero without. It's the only place where our hope can be found. The one who alone promises to help you and strengthen you and hold you up and protect you and guide you. The one who alone promises to meet every need according to his riches in glory. Right. So just go out and sin all you want and um, God will hang on to you. Is that is that the message here? See, that that's that's the question. Right. And that's that's where these antinomians have such difficulty is because they don't understand the difference between justification and sanctification. See, Chavichin can preach a good sanctification message because honestly, what he just said there in a lot of ways when he was when he's if you put it in the realm of sanctification, that works. But when you put it in the realm of justification, uh, of sanctification, it doesn't work. So to say that, just go and behave however you want to, cheat on your wife, gamble, drink, whatever you know, break break the commands of Holy Scripture, just at your whim, because God's going to use that all for good anyway. See that somebody. Literally, somebody could walk out of that service with that message. That's the thing. Somebody could walk out of this sermon with that message. I'm going to go out and do whatever I feel like doing because God's going to use it all for good anyway. And um, I really have no control over this anyhow. So I'm just going to go do whatever I want to do. I'm just going to go create all kinds of destruction and... That's the problem, isn't it? Because that's not what Holy Scripture teaches. That's not what St. Paul teaches at all. Talk about justification. We don't do anything for our justification. We are justified by Christ's person and work. And now we are adopted sons of God Most High. And he says, You sons of of mine this is how we behave here we behave according to the ten commandments which i wrote with my finger that's how we behave right and that's what saint paul teaches us that's what jesus teaches us throughout the gospels throughout saint paul's epistles throughout all of the apostles teachings all the prophets teachings that's the idea see and you know what it's not such a bad thing to become a good man i mean i'm not i'm not saying that i've arrived there but i've tasted a little bit of it of what of what it's like to be a good husband good father good worker kind of like that the art of manliness. Follow God's commands. I like that. Makes me feel good about me. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, me feeling good about me is really not the majority of it. My, my, my wife is happy that I'm a good man to her. My children are happy that I'm a good father to them. Makes their lives better. Okay. And is Chivichin talking about any of this? No, unfortunately, he's not. He's not talking about how the commands of Holy Scripture